Okay, so I'm going to start by contradicting you. Uh, tonight, we're definitely going to learn something useful. This actually may change your life, so I'd say that it's useful. Um, so what Sky and I are going to do is give you two different perspectives, the stoic and the existentialist one, on the basic question uh, put on, on, the, on the board, which is why shouldn't we commit suicide? Now, it sounds like the kind of question that only a philosopher would ask. And you're right, it, only a philosopher would in fact ask that kind of question. But as it turns out, once you start thinking about it, you say, ah, that is a, that's a good point. Uh, given that the universe has no meaning, given that uh, we're just a little rock in a, in a, in a, around a, a small star in a little part of the galaxy, and so on, so what the hell, what are we doing here? Well, we're drinking beer, for instance, <laughs> not coffee tonight. We're going to give these two perspectives, which means that we're going to have to give you a little bit of a in basic introduction to Stoicism first and to existentialism uh, next. And actually, can you tell me when I'm going to get close to being over time? Thank you. I'll reciprocate the, the, the favor. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll leave enough time for a Q&A because I'm sure that that's the part that is mof most fun for us because we've done this before. So I've heard myself talking about this stuff before. Basic things about stoicism. Before we get to the actual question and, and, let's, and talking about the serious stuff, you know, the suicide, why, why not, why yes, under what circumstances, and so on and so forth. That's a pretty heavy topic, uh, even, even from the strand. Uh, I need to give you a little bit of a background about stoicism. So first of all, let me tell you what stoicism is not about. Because a good number, there's a good chance that, that at least some of you uh, think of stoicism as something, a philosophy devoted to suppressing emotions, going through life with a stiff upper lip, basically Mr. Spock from Star Trek. Which is not by chance, since Gene Roddenberry actually designed the character of Spock by what Roddenberry thought was stoicism. The problem is Wikipedia was not out at the time, and so he got stoicism completely wrong. Not completely, but you know, largely wrong. So no, it's not about suppressing emotions, and it's not about you know, just going through life with a stiff upper lip, but it is about regulating your emotions and moving away from what the Stoics considered unhealthy, destructive emotions, such as anger, hatred, fear, things like that, and toward embracing and cultivating positive emotions, such as love and joy and a sense of justice, that sort of stuff. So that part, that's where the emotion part comes from. As far as the stiff upper lip, well, part of Stoicism is in fact endurance, but in a very specific case, in a very specific sense, that I'm going to tell you in a minute. Stoicism started out around 300 BCE in Athens. This guy, Zeno of Citium, he was, uh, Citium was uh, modern day Cyprus. He was a merchant, he was pretty well, well off. And he was going to uh, Athens and at some point, big storm, shipwreck, loses everything, makes it alive to um, Athens. And of course, the first thing that he does when he, goes, he gets to Athens, what is it? He goes into a bookstore, which didn't look probably like this, but it was a bookstore. And he starts reading. Uh, the first book that, pick, that he picks up is uh, The Memorabilia by Xenophon, which is a book about Socrates. He's so into it, he gets so into it that he turns to the uh, bookseller and says, where, where can I get me one of these, uh, meaning a philosopher? And, uh, and the bookseller says, well, there is one right over there walking by, because that was Athens at the time. There were philosophers going, you know, walking up and down the streets and that sort of stuff. That guy was Cratus of Tibis, one of the most famous philosophers of the time. Zeno started studying with him, then he studied with a bunch of other people, and eventually, a little later, founded his, no, his own school that it's called the Stoa, because, and hence the word Stoicism, it's called the Stoa because they met in a public place, the Stoa Poikile, which means uh, painted porch. They, they believed that they needed to bring philosophy to the, to the general public. They needed to change people's lives. So they were just uh, where people are, in the marketplace. OK, this thing went on for several centuries. Uh, you might have heard of some of the other big Stoics. Seneca was a Roman senator and uh, advisor to the emperor Nero. Marcus Aurelius was one of the few emperor philosophers of uh, the history of the world, you know, that sort of stuff. Now, the basic idea of Stoicism is really two fundamental notions. One is that we should live life according to nature. That's one of their, the stoic mottos, live according to nature, which I hasten to say does not mean running naked into the forest and hugging trees. That's not what they meant by living according to nature. They thought that human nature needs to be taken seriously, that if you want to figure out how to live your life, you should ask yourself what kind of thing you are. 
And it turns out that, according to them at least, the, the two fundamental features of humanity is that we are social animals. We don't do well outside of society. We can survive uh, you know, on a deserted island, but we don't want to do that. We thrive only in a society with, when we are, we are the people. So social and capable of reason. Now, I understand that, you know, especially these days, capable of reason, it's something that is laughable since people don't seem to be using reason very much, especially at the highest levels of, you know, political administration. But we are, they said they were capable of reason. Not, that's not to say they were always reasonable all the time. They put those two things together, and they basically they said the idea, therefore, a good life, a, a life worth living, what the Greeks called a eudaimonic life, which literally does mean you know, the life of flourishing, the life of uh, you know, a good life that's worth living. That is a life where you use your, your reason to improve social living. It's not a bad idea. If more of us actually started using reason to improve social living, I think that this would be immediately uh, such a much better place than, than it is. So that's the first notion. The second important notion in Stoicism, before we get to the suicide stuff, is um, what is called the dichotomy of control. The dichotomy of control is a notion that you're probably familiar with. How many people here has, uh, have heard of the serenity prayer? Yeah, all alcoholics, huh? Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, it's, the, it's, the pra it's a 20th century Christian prayer. Uh, was written down uh, at the beginning of the 20th century by a Christian theologian. It's often used in, in uh, um, step organizations like Alcoholic Anonymous. And I, in fact, now that I mention it, I don't actually remember exactly how it goes, but it's something along the lines of you asking God for the uh, wisdom to be able to tell the difference between what you can change and what you cannot change and the courage to accept what you cannot change and to actually do something about the stuff that you can change, right? That's the basic idea. Turns out that notion is actually found in a bunch of different cultures. You can find it in 8th century uh, Jewish theology. You find it in 4th century Buddhism. I crops up also in, in Taoism. But the earliest version we know of, I'm sure there were others, but the earliest version we know of is from a guy named Epictetus, who was a Stoic philosopher who lived in Rome uh, in the second century. And let me tell you about Epictetus. He was an interesting guy. So this guy started out his life in Hierapolis, which is in modern day uh, Turkey, as a slave. So the lowest possible rank of society. And he was apparently a slave of a pretty you know, bad guy. Uh, the, the, his master was beating him often. In fact, there is this story uh, that at one point his master started beating him on his, on his leg, and Epictetus looked at um, the master and his leg and said, you know, if you keep going, it's going to break. And of course, that's not what a master wants to, to hear. He kept banging on the, on the leg, which broke. Epictetus looked up and said, I told you it was going to break. He was actually uh, lame for the, for the rest of his life, and this was a permanent injury. Um, he was, fortunately for him, he was brought, bought by, uh, I know it's a strange thing to say, that it's, it's a fortunate thing to be bought, but he was bought by a, um, uh, one of the advisors to the Emperor Nero. He was brought to Rome, and there he started studying. He was given an education. Eventually, he was freed, and he started teaching Stoicism. Initially, it didn't go well because he started walking in the streets of Rome and started asking, you know, so have you heard the good news about stoicism? And he got punched on the nose a couple of times. So he figured that's not a good way to do it. Um, so instead, he, he started his own school. Eventually, he, was, he joined a political opposition against the emperors Nero, Vespasian, and Domitian. It's where he was kicked out of Rome together with a bunch of other philosophers. At the time, philosophers were actually doing important jobs. They were not just sitting in an academic chair at a university in the ivory tower and things like that. They were actually protesting against, you know, speaking truth to power. Power doesn't like to be spoken truth to. And so a bunch of these people were kicked out. Some of them were killed. And some of them were uh, sent in exile. Uh, Epictetus was sent into exile to Nicopolis in northwestern Greece. There he established uh, one of the most influential schools of antiquity. He, was very, he became a very famous teacher. His basic idea is this, this notion of the dichotomy of control. And he said, look, there are certain things that are under your control and other things that are not under your control, not under your complete control. And what you want to do is you want to focus your attention, your energy on the things you can control, and the rest you just accept as, as it comes, because you can't do anything about it anyway. 
He then went on and listed the kinds of things that fall into the first category and the kinds of things that fall in the second category. And you might be surprised at the list. The things under your control are your judgments, your opinions, which are a form of judgment, the values you choose, and the decisions you make to act or not act. Under, not under your control is pretty much everything else, which makes it very easy, right? It's like, oh, I got to remember only these three things that are under my control. It sounds strange, because if I tell you that, let's say, getting a job is not under my control, you probably would object. You say, what do you mean it's not under your control? Of course it is under your control. You go there, and you, you know, it's your interview. You, know, you, you go up, and you prepare, and all that sort of stuff. Right, but getting the job is not under my control. Preparing for the best interview that I can, studying, you know, putting together a resume, uh, rehearsing, all of that sort of stuff, that's under your control. Those are your judgments, your opinions, your, your actions. But actually getting the job is really not ultimately up to you. It's up to the boss, or it's, it depends on uh, other people that are competing for the same job. It's if the person who's interviewing you got up on the wrong foot of the bed and got inside of the bed this, that morning, you might not get the job. Right? So that's the idea, that everything you do, you split it into two components, the bit that is under your control and the bit that it's not. And what you cultivate is a focus on the first part and an attitude of equanimity toward the second part meaning that you're doing your best, and that's all you can do. There's nothing else you can do other than your best. So once you've done your best, you just accept that sometimes luck goes your way and sometimes it doesn't. And if it doesn't, you'll try it again the next time around. Right? So these are the two basic ideas of Stoicism. Now, the Stoics also went around uh, developing a lot of practices for how to actually implement these things. This was a very practical philosophy. Uh, Epictetus tells his students, if you're here just to, to, to uh, uh, hear me talk about logic and, and, and philosophy, you're in the wrong place. You have to practice. If you don't practice, you're wasting your time. So they developed a bunch of practices, and these practices have been so useful for like 2,000 years that back in the late 1950s and early 60s, uh, a number of people independently, mostly in the United States, started out a new movement in psychotherapy, which today is known as cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy started out as a direct influence of the Stoics. The first people that started out uh, back in the 50s and the early 60s actually had read Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and people like that, and said, ha, huh, there is some good stuff here. Maybe we can you know, uh, modify, improve it, uh, make it more modern and scientific, and we can go about it about our lives, improving the lives of other people. I'm getting to the suicide part in a bit. <laughs> or are you dying from learning about suicide? <laughs> All right, so let's talk about suicide. Now, I need to give you a couple of quotes if we're talking about suicide, because I want you to hear the actual voice of the Stoics. So the first thing that I want to bring up is a quote by Epictetus. I'm going to read it first, and then I'm going to explain what he, what he means. He says, don't believe your situation is genuinely bad. No one can make you do that. Is there smoke in the house? If it's not suffocating, I will stay indoors. If it proves too much, I'll leave. Always remember, the door is open. This is the so-called open door policy. This idea is that so long, the house, of course, is a metaphor for your life. And the idea is that sometimes situations get uncomfortable. And so long as you can stand the situation, so long as there is room to breathe, so long as you can do something about it, then you should decide to stay. In fact, the Stoics would say you have a duty toward other people to stay. You want to be helpful to other people. But you always have the way out. If the situation is really absolutely impossible and you cannot stand it, there's nothing you can do about it, there's nothing useful you can do, and there is no way to go on, then the door is open. You just open the door and get out. The door is, in fact, the possibility of committing suicide. The Stoics have thought of suicide actually as a ticket to freedom. Um, Seneca famously said that um, your freedom is as far as your wrist, meaning that you can cut it at any particular any time. You know, whenever, whenever you're done, you're done. Nobody can stop you from doing that. But you shouldn't do it unless it's absolutely the last resort. So they were very strict about when you're going to do these kind of things. The first duty for a Stoic is to be helpful to others. And as so long as you can be helpful to others, you have no excuses. But there are situations where you cannot, you're, you're no longer helpful to others. So let me give you an example of a situation where you shouldn't take the open door. This is another quote from Epictetus. And then I'll give you a couple of examples where the Stoics actually said that you, that you should. 
So the story goes that one of Epictetus' friends at some point decided to commit suicide. And one of his students rushed to Epictetus and says, hey, your friend is, you know, decided to starve himself to death, which was a standard way of doing it at the time. So Epictetus says, well, let's go and see him and see if we can help him. Because that's the first thing. If, if your friend has decided to do something, it's his decision, and you're supposed to be supportive and helpful, no matter what the decision is. So he goes there and says, why are you, why are you doing this? Uh, he says, if your decision is justified, look, here we are at your side and ready to help you on your way. But if your decision is unreasonable, then you ought to change it. So he asks him, so why did you decide to take the open door? And he said, well, because I said so. And Epictetus looks at him and is like, what are you, stupid? You don't, you don't live life just because you said so. This isn't a point of honor. It's just, it's, you have to have a good reason. So no, I'm not going to help you. That's not going to happen. Sure enough, the guy survived. There are situations, however, where the Stoics thought, well, yeah, that kind of raises to the level of seriously considering the situation. Let me give you a couple of examples from Stoic history although there are more recent ones uh, as well you can find easily. One of them is, in fact, Zeno himself, the founder of Stoicism, Zeno of Cyprus. He apparently committed suicide when he was in his late 90s, which for the time was an incredible age to survive. And the reason for that is because at that point, he essentially became completely dependent on other people. He had no possibility to teach anymore. He was not going to be helpful to anybody. Uh, it was simply a burden to other people. And so he simply stopped eating, and four or five days later, he died. Essentially, surrounding by his friends who were helping him through this thing. Essentially, the, this is what we today call assisted suicide. It's your choice at the end of your life, whether you have a, a terminal disease or you have a terminal life, because life is going to kill us all eventually. Uh, you decide to do it, then it's your decision. You have to go. It's a question of dignity. So one reason for the Stoics to take the open door is, in fact, uh, a matter of dignity. If to preserve your dignity, to preserve your, your uh, it's your choice, to make it your choice. The second one, it's going to be a little bit more um, interesting to listen to, although I have to alert you because this is a pretty tough story to listen to. This, uh, this happened to Cato the Younger. Cato the Younger was a famous Roman senator and general at the time of Julius Caesar. Uh, he thought that Caesar was a tyrant, and so he opposed it, which turned out to be true because you know, that was the end of the Republic. Caesar marked the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the empire. Uh, so Cato was a political opponent of Caesar, and they, the two battled in the Senate for many, many years. Uh, Cato had developed this incredible reputation as one of the most honest people in, in ancient Rome, which wasn't easy because people were, you know, as people in power have always done what people in power do. They take advantage of their position. The guy was a, such a level of integrity that he never stole a, a, you know, a cistertium from anybody. Uh, he always did the right thing, so much so that he, be, he became so famous in Rome for doing that, that when other people would fail at something, their excuse was, well, not everybody can be a Cato. And so it was that kind of level of integrity. It's like when you're using him as an excuse, so it's, that's too difficult. Fine. Uh, move forward, fast forward. Things don't go well in, uh, in, you know, in, the, in the political arena. Eventually, Cato and some of his friends take up arms against Julius Caesar. So there is a civil war. And in the end, they are defeated. Right? Caesar was an excellent general, manages to win the war and to corner his opponents. And he gives very strict instructions to his soldiers to capture Cato alive. And the reason he wants to do that is because he wants to use him as a political pawn. He wants to capture him alive. He's the most famous uh, man in Rome, high level of, of uh, you know, personal integrity. He wants to capture him alive and then pardon him to show to the Roman people that, you know, Caesar can be great in, uh, even in victory. He doesn't have to you know, kill other people. Cato knows this, so he says, nah, not going to happen. I'm going to take the open door as a matter of principle. So he tries to take the open door. One of the ways in which the Romans did it, he takes a dagger, which was a, a sword about this long, and he tries to uh, stab himself. And 
he fails, he, to sort of, he, he injures himself, but only partially because he had been in battle, and in battle he had an injury to the right hand, so it wasn't strong enough. So he falls down in his room, makes a noise, his friends rush in, his doctor sees what happened and goes there and tries to sort of stop the, the bleeding. He figures out that he had not punctured any, any vital organs, so he's like, okay. Cato sees this, reaches down inside his guts, tears them apart, and throws them on the floor. I told you this was a hard story. <laughs> it takes guts, I guess, so to do that sort of stuff, although that was the last time, I suppose. Um, that was another reason why they would do it, as a question of principle. If it helps society to a large degree, if he thought that it was going to be helpful to, for Roman society, then you do it. The third and, on, and last example that we have from the ancient Stoics is when it preserves your family, when it protects your family. I mentioned Seneca. Seneca was an advisor to the emperor Nero. Nero was not an easy fellow to advise. Uh, in the first few years, things were okay, and then Nero started getting more and more unhinged. Uh, uh, Seneca started, tried to retire, he moved away from Rome, but at some point, Nero thought that Seneca was in a conspiracy, was part of a conspiracy to kill uh, the emperor. Probably not true, although we know that Seneca knew about the conspiracy and didn't say anything, which is almost as good as being part of the conspiracy. So as often the Roman emperors did, uh, Nero sends his guards to Seneca's house and invites him to commit suicide. Says, you know, your way out is the open door. You gotta, you gotta do it yourself, however. We don't wanna spill our, uh, your blood. Now, at the time, this was not unusual, and a lot of people try to escape from it. But the problem is, if you escape from it, then uh, the emperor will take it up on your family. So they will go after your wife or your children or you know, everything, um, anybody who was uh, close to you. And so Seneca says, no, I don't, that's not gonna happen. I'm, I'm gonna do it. So he's, he did it in order to um, preserve, essentially, his family, his wife, and his children. So those are the things. But as you can see, those are pretty extreme examples. Under any other circumstances, the Stoics would say, no, you don't do it. Now, let me read you a couple of other quotes before I give the floor to Sky about this. And these are, one is from Seneca and the other one is from Marcus Aurelius. This is about the flip side of the coin of suicide. So it's true that the door is always open and it's your ticket to freedom and you wanna use it under extreme circumstances. But the flip side of that coin is that if you don't use it, if you stay, then every moment of your life counts. The Stoics were very big in sort of time management in a sense. They, they thought that, you know, I don't know when I'm gonna die. You don't know. We have statistical expectations. Oh, I'm gonna live another 20 years. I'm gonna live another 30. Yeah, on average. But in fact, you actually don't know, right? And so they were very conscious of this thing that, that, that especially at the time, that um, death could be literally around the corner. And so they said things like this. This is Seneca. Hold every hour in your grasp. Lay hold of today's task, and you will not need to depend so much upon tomorrow's. While, you are, while we are postponing, life speeds by. This today sounds like pretty normal kind of advice, you know, self-help advice that people would get if you go to the self-help section of the book. But what he's saying here is that make every minute count. And by count, of course, he means in the stoic way, be helpful to other people. L try to live this a better world than you found. He's not talking about making millions and, and, and uh, become, you know, sending rockets to, Mar to Mars because you got billions to use and you don't know what else to do with them. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't have to spell it out, yes? He's talking about stuff that actually really matters and what the, for the Stoics what mattered was be, be helpful to other people. And here's Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was an interesting guy. Um, the three major Stoics have very different temperaments. I love all three of them, and, if, and I invite you to read some, some of their writings because they're very different people. Seneca is a beautiful writer. He, he really speaks to you uh, very nicely. His, uh, his, his turn of phrase is incredible, uh, and he's very down to earth. You can, you, you can relate to him. In fact, the book that I would suggest for, from Seneca is the letters to his friend Lucilius, 
because that's what they are, a bunch of letters where he talks about Stoic philosophy, but he also talks about what he had the morning for breakfast. Um, and it's really, thank you, and it's really engaging kind of writing. Epictetus is blunt, sarcastic. One of my favorite quotes from Epictetus is, I have to die, well, if it's now, I'll die now, but if it's not time yet, I'm hungry, so I'm gonna go for lunch. <laughs> that's the kind of attitude he had. Marcus, on the other hand, was kind of, um, broody and on his own, and he's, he's clearly a, you know, not, he didn't enjoy the company of people, but he had to stay in the company of a lot of people because guess what, he was the emperor, right? So there is not, it was part of his, his duties. So here's a quote from Marcus. A limit time is fixed for you, which if you do not use for clearing away the clouds from your mind, it will go, and you will go, and it will never return. So don't waste your time, clear your clouds, Drink some beer and welcome Sky. So Frederick Nietzsche said that there are three great banalities in life. The first one is death. The second one is birth, naturally. And does anyone know what the third one is? No. That a good guess. Anyone? Marriage, exactly. We all go through these same three things in life. It's just the same performance, but new actors in every generation. And Nietzsche says, you know, it's a wonder we all haven't hung ourselves just out of boredom. So he was joking, but he's also serious. And suicide is really serious. It's the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Um, there's about 45,000 people who die of suicide every year. For those of you math nerds who are working it out, yes, 123 per day. Um, and the problem is with suicide, yeah, sorry, I'm not doing a warm up, obviously, jumping straight in. Um, the problem with suicide is that quite often we're very quick to judge. We judge people as kind of selfish and irresponsible for leaving us, or we dismiss it as a mental illness. Now, the philosophers thought that, hey, maybe there's sort of a third option. Uh, the Stoics did, and also the existentialists said, maybe it's a perfectly reasonable and rational response to the human condition. So I'm gonna talk about three philosophers today. Frederick Nietzsche, who is perhaps the, uh, well, I think is the wittiest philosopher, but he also definitely wins the award for the craziest moustached philosopher. Um, I'm gonna talk also about Albert Camus, who is clearly the hottest philosopher that ever was. <laughs> and I'm also gonna talk about Simone de Beauvoir, who I think is probably the most brilliant philosopher of all time. Now, these philosophers are all associated with the existential school, and they all acknowledge the same fundamental problem. And that problem is, uh, but they have come up with different solutions, but the problem is what Nietzsche described as, he said, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. Now, what he means by this is that religion used to give us meaning in our life. Uh, we're here because God put us here, and the goal of life is to be good so that we all get into heaven. But the problem is, science came along. We had this thing called the Enlightenment, which, in which we found out that actually we're not here because of Adam and Eve, we're here because of evolution. Um, the problem, though, is that the value structure that we've had for thousands of years had then been destroyed by science. But science can't provide value. Science can tell us how the world works, but it doesn't tell us how we should live. And without a god, there is no inherent value and meaning in life. God isn't giving it to us. Science can't give it to us. So the existential philosophers were interested in how to respond to this vacuum of meaning in life. And they're asking questions like, what's the point? And as Massimo um, said, if there's no meaning in life, like why shouldn't we kill ourselves? So Friedrich Nietzsche is, uh, 
provocative to say the least. And this is like a, a blanket trigger warning. I'm, I'm not going to hold back on what he says. Um, Nietzsche even said, I am dynamite because he wanted to blow up and challenge all those assumptions and beliefs that we hold so close to our heart. Nietzsche thought that suicide is legitimate in a few different circumstances, and I'm going to talk about three. So the first circumstance is if you're famous, okay? So he said, consider, if you're famous, consider your career trajectory and when you want to leave your legacy. Uh, he said, you have to discontinue being feasted upon when you taste best. And they didn't even have social media in that time. Um, but uh, so he says that, you know, if you're famous, you have to practice the difficult art of leaving at the right time. Okay, the second one reason is old age. Now Nietzsche says, imagine a machine. It's all, sorry, this is like the most beaten up machine I could find. But <laughs> imagine, like, imagine a washing machine. It's rusty, it's old, it's broken. It costs a lot of money to maintain um, and get fixed all the time. It doesn't really wash your clothes or it hardly washes your clothes very well at all. Now Nietzsche says, do you like keep putting time and effort and money into that washing machine until it, until it dies, until it literally can't go any longer? Or do you try and retire that machine at a graceful time and replace it with a newer machine that is able to wash your clothes better and trust your clothes washing to a new machine? He wasn't talking specifically about washing machines. This is just a general machine. Um, so. And he said the same of people. Like, if you're really old and it's just, you're, you're just hanging on for the sake of hanging on, it's like, why would you do that? And in fact, he also said, it's probably a, a doctor's social responsibility to encourage people to leave when they're done. And the third one, the third uh, reason he said it was um, legitimate to leave was when people are terminally ill. He says, let's die proudly when it's no longer possible to live proudly. The problem is, in these circumstances and some others, we all tend to be like these kind of rotten apples, these sour apples on the tree, hanging on to the tree of life until the tree of life forces us to let go. And he's like, why, don't, why do we have to wait until the last day of autumn? His point was that there's, there's no respect in hanging on just for the sake of hanging on. And Nietzsche thought that natural death is completely irrational. He said it's like a grinning thief, like sadistic thief, like creeping around in the night, just waiting to surprise us. Um, and why should we have to wait for a slow and painful extinction? Or not even have to, why, why would we want to wait for a slow and painful extinction? Well, Nietzsche's like, we shouldn't. Let's free ourselves from the tyranny of religion that says we should hang on until it's God's decision for us to go. Let's also free ourselves from the tyranny of nature in which we're slaves to our body or, or you know, the world around us and that tells us when to go. Um, he says, let's bring death back into our control. And certainly, it's really tragic when people die too young, um, but other people are very youthful way up into old age. So if this is like you, he's like, for sure, hang on, keep going, that's fine. Um, you know, there's no need to hurry. But his point was, let's die at the right time. Now, he wanted us to have good and respectable and voluntary deaths. So does anyone know who this guy is? It's, it's David Goodall. And he was an Australian biologist. He was in the news um, back in May. Uh, he was 104 years old. Uh, he um, had had enough of life. He wasn't terminally ill. And he said goodbye to his family and friends. He took off to Switzerland with a couple of his closest uh, family and friends. And he belted out Ode to Joy by Beethoven for a while, and then went through the assisted suicide program. Uh, now Nietzsche would have approved of this because Dr. Goodall had a proper farewell. 
he was still himself. He didn't have like Alzheimer's or, or was suffering from dementia. He could still value his life. Now, Nietzsche says we ought to be treating death, not as poison as we so often do, but why don't we treat it as a celebration of life or a coronation of life? Let's turn it into a festival. He's like, if you've had a meaningful life, if you've achieved your goals, then maybe it's okay to move on. So, I mean, the main problem with this is that it's often hard to tell when the right time to die is. Um, and what about for the rest of us? Those who aren't terminally ill, those who aren't so old, um, those who aren't famous. I mean, I'm speaking for myself. I don't know, Massimo here is kind of famous. <laughs> um, so, yes, Nietzsche says it is genuinely horrifying that there is no meaning in life. It really is. And if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. So Nietzsche had a few different solutions. Um, three of his main ones were that, okay, don't stare too long into the abyss. Um, it's like staring at the sun. You know, we sort of do it. We know we shouldn't. And he's like, that's, that's just going to make you super depressed. Like, don't do that. Um, another solution he suggested is art. He's like, create art. Make your life a creation. Or go to an art gallery because truth is ugly. And we possess art lest we perish of the truth. And another suggestion he has is like, you know what? Like man must from time to time believe he knows why he exists. His race cannot thrive without a periodic trust in life, without faith in the reason in life. So Nietzsche's point was sometimes we just have to believe. And this is why one of his mantras is say yes to life, love fate, embrace life, amor fati. Um, and one of the goals that he suggested is striving towards the ideal of the ubermensch, which is let's constantly overcome ourselves and throw ourselves into life and strive to be the best we can be. Now, Albert Camus said, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Now, people do commit suicide because they don't find any meaning in life, but people also get killed for ideas that they believe in. I mean, think of martyrs and suicide missions. So the question of suicide for Camus is intimately tied to the meaning we attribute or don't attribute to life. And Camus says that suicide implies that you've realized that our daily routines are completely insane. Our habits in life are ridiculous. We work, we eat, we sleep, day in, day out. I mean, there is no profound meaning in that. And maybe it's fine if we're just operating on autopilot, but Camus says the problem is when we stop and reflect and that why starts creeping in. He says this is absurdity. The absurdity is the confrontation of the irrational world with the human heart's wild longing for clarity. Absurdity is born of the confrontation between the human need for meaning and the unreasonable silence of the world. I mean, that's, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and I can see why when he says things like that. It's beautiful. Um, so Camus is concerned with how we live in that tension. Okay, how do we live in Nietzsche's abyss? Nietzsche said, don't stare too long into the abyss. Camus is like, I'm not going to turn away from the abyss. I want to look straight into it. And how do I live looking right into the abyss? So there are a few different responses. Okay, we've already talked about religion, the first one. Believing that a god or gods put us here and that they, they're giving us meaning in life. Now Camus is often associated with the existential school, but he didn't want any part of that um, because he thought the existentialists sold out. Um, Nietzsche leapt out of the abyss to the Ubermensch ideal and we'll, I'll talk in a minute about um, why he thought Beauvoir sold out. Also, suicide is a perfectly reasonable uh, response to the abyss. Um, but 
um, Camus thought that it's a bit of like defeatism. Um, it's like letting the absurdity win. So Camus decided on rebellion. Um, and he, he didn't want to leap into, into the abyss and commit suicide. He didn't want to leap out of the abyss like the existentialist did or like, like you do in religion. Um, he thought that um, we should remain on the dizzying crest. He thought that was integrity. He didn't want to believe in lies or hope or try and lie to ourselves about meaning in life. And so his solution was to rebel against the absurdity, to rebel against death. And this rebellion is what gives life meaning. It transforms an invitation to death into a rule of life. Now, the anecdote that Camus uses to talk about this kind of uh, approach is the myth of Sisyphus. Now, stories vary super wildly um, about Sisyphus. Some people think he was a, a pretty awful guy. Um, he killed a lot of people. Um, he impregnated his niece to get back at his brother. Um, and he really pissed off Zeus. Um, but you need to hear the full story because Zeus kidnapped a woman and Sisyphus told um, the woman's father where she was, and Zeus got really upset about that. Um, so it depends what side of the story you're on. So anyway, Zeus, whatever the story you've heard about Sisyphus, the punishment is always the same. It's rolling that giant rock up a hill only to watch it fall back down again, forever, over and over again. Now Camus is particularly interested in the moment that Sisyphus is walking down the hill, because that is the moment of reflection. So Sisyphus, he's powerless because he's condemned by Zeus to do this forever, but he's also rebellious because he knows his condition. And this lucidity, this knowing his condition, that's supposed to be his torture, but Camus says it's also his victory because he's stronger than his rock. When he does this, he does it with passion, he rolls it up, he lets it fall back down again. It's like he's saying, screw you, Zeus. Now Camus says, you know, he doesn't look very happy there, but in fact, we really have to imagine Camus happy. Because if we imagine him melancholic, that is to let the rock win. It's to let absurdity win. Now, ultimately, Camus' solution is to say yes to life, a bit like Nietzsche. Camus thought we should live with vitality and lucidity and determination, just like Sisyphus did, without lies, without hope. The problem is, that's super hard to do, which is why Camus says, in the end, we need more courage to live than to kill ourselves. So Simone de Beauvoir, she completely agrees with Nietzsche and Camus that God is dead. And she agrees that that's like a super important problem. And as we saw, Camus thought that he was more consistent than Nietzsche because Nietzsche um, tried to leap out of the abyss through the Ubermensch ideal. Um, and Beauvoir thought, though, that Camus' approach was too abstract. She's like, yes, we need to rebel against the absurdity. But unless we're rebelling for something, it's kind of empty. For Beauvoir, rebellion only becomes meaningful when we use it for something positive, like political struggle, revolution, escape, some kind of positive action that gives our rebellion a future. So, but one of the few situations that Beauvoir thought suicide is valid is where your future is blocked. So Sisyphus, he's, he doesn't have a future. He's condemned to rolling that rock up and down that hill forever. He doesn't have a future. His rebellion has no concrete outcome. She also gives the example of a slave girl in a harem who's horribly oppressed. There's no means of escape. And Bouvard's point is that in some situations like that, it's possible that you can only rebel by denying your situation, which is through suicide. But for the most part, Beauvoir was against suicide. 
Okay, for this part, I am gonna need two volunteers. Can I tempt anyone? Great, thanks. Could you come up the front, please? I need one more. Great, thanks so much. Okay, could you stand here? Okay, this is it. Okay, just have a read through that for a minute. Okay, this is um, an adaptation from Simone de Beauvoir's The Mandarins, which won the Prix Goncourt in 1954, which is a super glamorous, like, important French prize. Um, imagine, it's Paris, post-World War II. Um, the, you, you two are very uh, glamorous, um, trendy intellectuals, and you're wearing black, perfect. You two, you know, <laughs> you would fit right in as well. Um, and so you hang out at uh, jazz bars in Paris. Um, you smoke a lot of cigarettes. Um, you drink whiskey on the rocks. You do? Okay, perfect. <laughs> fit right in. Okay, um, so you're Anne. You're a brilliant psychoanalyst, and you're having a wild and passionate love affair with an American novelist. Not him. No. <laughs> Robert, you're the leader of a liberal political group. Um, you're in the resistance, and so is Anne. Um, you're Anne's husband, um, and <laughs> you know all about the affair, but you're actually not pissed off because you're having heaps of passionate affairs too. Uh, uh, so yeah, <laughs> it's like an open marriage. Um, so this is a role play. I'm going to come over and give you the, um, the microphone for when your turn is. Who's first? Yeah. So please, be as th theatrical as you like. Anne, you're up first. Go ahead. I was thinking today that, you know, okay. I was thinking today that people are really wrong to torment themselves over anything and everything. Things are never as important as they seem. They change, they end, and above all, when all is said and done, everyone dies. That settles everything. That's just the way of escaping from problems. Unless it's that problems are a way of escaping the truth. Of course, when you've decided that it's life that's real, the idea of death seems like escape. But conversely... No, there's a difference. The fact of living proves you've chosen to believe in life. If one honestly believes that death alone is real, then one should kill oneself. Actually, though, even suicides don't think so. It may be that people go on living simply because they're scatterbrained and cowardly. It's easier that way, but that doesn't prove anything either. First of all, it's important that suicide be difficult. And then continuing to live isn't only continuing to breathe one ever succeeds in settling down in complete apathy. You like certain things, you hate others, you become indignant, you admire, all, all, the, all of which implies that you recognize the values of life. I'm not worried. Like myself, everyone you feel yourself powerless in the face of certain overwhelming facts. So you can take refuge in the generalized skepticism. You don't really mean it. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause, please? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, OK, so. These two characters represent two different philosophical views. So Anne is very much representing kind of a flippant, resigned view. She's like, we're all going to die. Nothing really matters. Most of us just go through life on autopilot, um, or we don't kill ourselves just because we're afraid of death. 
Okay, but Robert, I mean, besides the mansplaining at the end, telling Anne that she uh, doesn't really mean what she says, um, Robert is actually much closer to Simone de Beauvoir's philosophical views. Um, he says that the fact of living proves that you've chosen to believe in life. There are things like love, hate, admiration. These are all attachments to life. Um, and sometimes we do feel powerless. Sometimes we do feel skeptical about life. Um, but the point is to become aware, to become conscious and cognizant of those things that we do value in life. Some of those things, love, it's a big one, friendship, I mean, objects, like your favorite teddy bear, or events, like, I don't know, not like Fashion Week, like, like Think Olio events. Um, so, uh, where's that? Um, yeah, so the point is, Robert's point, Beauvoir's philosophical point, is that if you're still here, and you are, um, it means that you have some attachment to existence, and your life is commensurate with this attachment which is very different to, obviously, Buddhism, which says that our attachments are the cause of our suffering. Um, and Beauvoir would say, yes, quite often our lovers are very much the cause of our suffering, but they also give us meaning in life, so uh, let's run with that. Um, now, at the end of this book, The Mandarins, Anne does contemplate suicide. I'm sorry, but her love affair with uh, the American novelist comes to an end. She ends up getting super bored with her husband. Sorry about that. Um, and she hates her job. She's just become indifferent to the world. And so much so that just to go on living, she finds really excruciating. Her daughter's all grown up and doesn't need her anymore. So suicide to her at that point. Sorry, this is a spoiler alert, by the way. Um, I should have mentioned that before. Um, so her point is that she says she, she's about to drink this vial of poison when she hears her daughter's voice outside. And that to Anne is kind of a jarring realization because she thinks about the effect that her death will have on other people. And she says, my death does not belong to me because it's the others who would live my death. So Anne, at the end, kind of resigns to living. Um, but the philosophical point is, A, that it's this attachment to her daughter that justifies her world. That is her meaning in life. And second of all, whereas Camus thought of uh, suicide as very much an individual decision, uh, Nietzsche also thought of it as, as an individual decision, but also a little bit like the Stoics, like there was a, like a social benefit to suicide in some cases. So Beauvoir very much takes into account the more relational aspect. She takes into account other people, the ones that we love. So in conclusion, Okay, so none of these philosophers killed themselves. They all went for coffee. Well, I mean, Beauvoir, she's drinking coffee there with Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, literally, in almost every photo you see of Simone de Beauvoir, she's drinking something. Um, here she's drinking wine, uh, beer, like almost every photo. Um, now, oh, Nietzsche uh, drank milk. He preferred milk. He said alcohol made him act like a sailor on shore leave. Um, <laughs> So they, uh, yeah, but uh, so Nietzsche did go mad at the end of his life. It was really tragic, went mad during the last 10 years of his life. Um, he couldn't make any decisions whatsoever. Um, I think if he had any indication or any inclination of the state he was in, he might have seriously taken his own philosophy into his own hands. Um, Camus died at age 46 in a car accident. Once he said that to die in a car accident is the most absurd death of all. <laughs> and in fact, what makes it even more absurd is that Camus had an unused train ticket for that very trip in his pocket. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir died of old age, about age 80, a few years after Jean-Paul Sartre, who was her lifelong partner. And she was surrounded definitely by the people she loved. So. As far as should I kill myself or have a cup of coffee, obviously these philosophers do not advocate for that. Um, I don't advocate for it. I mean, have whatever beverage floats your boat. Have, have, have some more beer. Um, and, 
but appreciate the attachments that you do have in life. Um, I can't tell you what those attachments are. I certainly can't tell you what the meaning of life is. That's up to you. Um, but I will say, as the existentialist did, that say yes to life with a few exceptions. Thank you. Oops, I, sorry, I forgot a few more photos of Camus because you know how I feel about him. Uh, here he is winning the, winning the Nobel Prize and drinking champagne. And here he is. He also was a chain smoker, loved cigarettes. He even called his cat cigarettes. That's how much he loved them. So thank you. <laughs> Who wants to make a point? Ask, there's a microphone right in the middle. So they're to your left, to your, yes, left. Uh, question for Massimo. It sounds like the Stoics were uh, founded by people who had very extreme life experiences. Um, yeah. what, is it, what does it mean for people who have ordinary life experiences, if that's possible? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, a lot of the Stoics that we know about definitely had unusual experiences. But then again, so, so I think did some of the existence. You know, every philosopher, famous philosopher probably you can think of was an unusual person uh, in, that, in that respect. Uh, um, but yeah, Stoicism in ancient Rome, certainly in Greece, was a common philosophy. Uh, lots of people adopted it as a way to cope with life. Uh, it's not different uh, in the modern version, uh, modern Stoicism is really not that different from uh, sort of some kind of secular Buddhism. In fact, I think of Stoicism as the Western equivalent of uh, Buddhism. The, the metaphysics are very different. So the Stoics start with a very different view of how the world works uh, compared with the Buddhist. But the ethics are very similar. Uh, so how do you actually behave in life? It's actually very similar. And one of the reasons that Sky and I wrote this article uh, together on which this, this uh, evening is based is because we noticed that, again, the Stoics and the existentialists started out with very different uh, starting points. But it actually converged toward very similar things. I mean. When uh, when Sky was saying, you know, it's all about, uh, you know, reacting and doing something useful in life, or or, or it's about, you know, your family and the people that are important to you, the Stoics would say exactly the same thing. Uh, when they, you know, Seneca would say, yeah, it's it's about your 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 wife, your daughter, your your friends. That's those are very important. Uh, the Stoics put a very very strong emphasis on friendship as a major source of meaning in life. Both philosophies don't seek meaning outside. They don't, they don't think that somebody's come from out there and says, you know, here's what you're supposed to do. It's up to you. And that's what makes you responsible. Both of them advocate suicide in only very, very extreme circumstances. Otherwise, you have a sort of duty toward yourself and others to, to stay and, and fight on. Uh, right in front. One second. So um, I'm thinking about people who um, go on hunger strikes. And sometimes they uh, will do it to the point of death. OK, now there is the other consideration is that people feel that um, they should prevent a person from going on a hunger strike to the point of death. So they. Uh, they would force feed them. Um, so, you know, I can see their point in a way, you know, force feeding a person. But then again, I can see the other side of it. Yeah, uh, thanks. The existentialists uh, definitely would have had a problem with that. However, Beauvoir does give one example in uh, one of her works. And she says um, a young woman, um, not a hunger strike, but a young woman, um, attempted suicide. Her friends found her in time, took her to a hospital, and got her help. And she ended up having um, a fulfilling life, uh, family, and uh, people she loved. So in that sort of circumstance, Beauvoir would say, uh, yeah, it's fine to, to intervene. Um, in terms of something like a hunger strike where 
uh, Camus specifically addressed this when he said that some people, um, you know, kill themselves because they have no meaning, but other people risk their lives because that's how they do find meaning. And so I think Camus would have thought it's 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 up to the individual to choose when to do that. He would probably advise against it, but ultimately it's the individual's decision, especially if they're they're lucid and um, you know they they know what they're doing. Yeah, and the story, I mean, I gave the example of Epictetus rushing to his friend and say, yeah, here I am, I can, I can help you. And then he finds out that there is no, no good reason why the friend is trying to commit suicide. And so he says, no, well, I'm not going to, not only am I not going to help you and beat you the, the, the crap out of you so that you stop doing this nonsense. So the Stoics do believe in intervention if, in fact, it turns out that there is no good reason behind it, or obviously if somebody has, you know, a mental issue, depression, or things like that, then, then it's, it's a no-brainer to buy, try to be helpful rather than, because the person is not actually in, in his right mind or her right mind in making a decision. But ultimately, it is a question of personal responsibility. And um, for the Stoic, one of the things that falls outside of your control is somebody else's decisions. You can talk to them, you can influence them, you can, you know, you can try to uh, reason with them, but ultimately, the buck stops at the individual. If the individual has made cert a certain decision, then it's, you know, all you can do is to respect that decision and... and, and um, go along with it. Even if he's your friend, even helping, in fact. And there's another question down the Yeah, the, the microphone's coming. Oh, thanks. I was just curious um, about the Epicurean school of thought, which is more like seize the day kind yeah. of thinking, pursuit of pleasure maybe, hedonism. Yeah. Did they have any stance on suicide? Um, did the Epicureans have a stance on suicide? That's a good question. Uh, I can tell you a few things about the, the Epicureans, but of course the Stoics have a 2,000-year-old diatribe against the Epicureans, so you probably don't want to ask a Stoic um, <laughs> about the, the damn Epicureans. So the Epicureans, first of all, have a bad reputation which is undeserved. And it's mostly the result of the fact of essentially Christian slandering of the, of the Epicureans. Because the Epicureans had um, exposed a metaphysics that really did not go well with the Christian one. They believed that the, the universe is made of atoms randomly bumping into the void. Uh, that there was no creator, no, no nothing like that. So the, the, the Christians really didn't like them. And that's how the Epicureans got the reputation of being the sex, and drugs, and rock and roll of philosophy, right? But they were really not like that. Yes, they did say that pleasure is important in life, but it's, they were talking about small pleasures, the pleasure of you know, a simple meal, of a simple life, the pleasure of friendship, the, the pleasure of you know, hanging around with people that you like. And in fact, mostly, the Epicurean practice was about avoiding pain, not so much seeking pleasure, but avoiding pain. Um, now, that said, there is a story about Epicurus who was apparently very sick when he was old, and he had some kind, it's, not, it's hard to tell what exactly he had, but it was apparently something really painful. And there is a story that nobody believes about him except the Epicureans, which is that despite the fact that he was in terrible pain and he was about to die, he kept on having conversations with his students about philosophy. And in fact, he made him notice that, you know, see, I don't care about the fact that I'm in terrible pain. Nobody believes that story except the, the Epicureans. Um, but I don't think they had a particular sense about suicide. Uh, it is about avoidance of pain, but sometimes suicide can, in fact, be a way to avoid pain, right? So if it's, especially if it is, again, terminal, a terminal situation, so. Hi, uh, thank you so much so far. I really appreciate everything you had to say. Uh, I had two quick thoughts that sort of came out uh, over the course of the talk. Uh, one, if you, this might be a generalization, but like a collection of philosophies as a way to kind of balance out natural programming of the human brain. Uh, and the flip side, I was sort of interested to learn about uh, Bevor, if I'm pronouncing the name correct, uh, if that matches closely with metamodernism, ways of thinking. So could you repeat the first part of your question? And I'm not sure what meta, I'm not. So I was just sort of uh, interested. It seemed, you know, there might be natural urges, maybe emotional, or how we kind of deal with things, maybe irrationally, because it's purely off of just emotional at that point, and ways of thinking. I'm thinking like Buddhism or secular Buddhism, where we, we do different practices to cultivate different ways of thinking and being that can kind of counteract what we might just sort of naturally go, and so that we can have a more fuller life if we practice that way of thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, so certainly all, all these existentialists were, um, so for example, Nietzsche. I mean, I'm talking about Nietzsche as an existentialist 
existentialist. He's, I mean, you may argue that he wasn't, but um, for, for these purposes, I am. But he um, talked about um, like the Dionysian and the Apollonian aspects of life. Um, the Dionysian is like the, the passionate, the emotional um, side of life, whereas the, um, the Apollonian is very much like the rational side of life. And whereas like Plato and Aristotle were all like, let's be all rational, ra being rational is the best. Nietzsche and the existentialists were like, hey, no, passion's pretty good too. Let's be passionate. Let's not forget about those emotions, which are amazing and like a really intense and beautiful part of life. But Nietzsche talked about it as needing to be um, like almost like a symphony. Like you know, they need to be in balance. Like the Dionysian, like it's kind of wild and crazy, you know, the, the god of um, wine and it can get all crazy. So it needs to be kind of counterbalanced by, by the, the rational side of things. And I think they all were kind of toying with the balance of emotions and rationality um, and thought they were both valuable, but um, kind of, uh, yeah, keeping them in check. I think that that's what they, they would say. Yeah, I think it's philosophy in general is to some extent the idea that you want to figure out a way to transcend the animal side in you. We are animals, there is no denying it. Uh, and certainly the Stoics were very conscious of that. They, they knew that we have urges, we have you know, things that we want to do that come natural and so on and so forth. So they just thought that not all of those are necessarily a good idea uh, and that there are things that you might figure out in life that are actually more important or better for you to do than, uh, than what comes natural in that sense. That's why I qualified initially when I said that one of their mottos was live according to nature. That doesn't mean live naturally uh, because living naturally, it's actually, a, in philosophy, that's a logical fallacy. An appeal to nature, it's a logical fallacy. It's, it says that whatever is natural is good. Well, clearly not. There's lots of stuff that it's natural, like poisonous mushrooms, which are definitely not good for you. So you have to make choices, right? So philosophy is all about making choices. Now, some of the differences between both these two philosophies and others that we haven't talked about tonight is exactly on how you can transcend transcend the human animal. What, what is it that you're going to do beyond, beyond being an animal? What, beyond beyond the, the, what comes natural? What is it that's important to you? Why is it important to you to do certain things? Clearly, you guys have figured out that there is something important for you to do tonight other than being a human animal, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. This is not, this is not a good place to be a human animal. Um, so, and that's part of the thing that I think that makes philosophy interesting, that there are, philosophers have come up over the last 3,000 years or so with a number of different options. And in fact, Sky and I have just finished putting together a manuscript of an edited book uh, together with a colleague of ours, uh, Dan Kaufman, which is going to be published next year. And it's going to be, what's the title of it? How to Live a Good Life. There you go. How to Live a Good Life. I started it. Um, how to live a good life. And the idea is we asked 14 colleagues, each one of, of whom is uh, practicing a particular philosophy or religion. So to write about their experiences. What, what, is it, what does it mean to live like a Stoic or to live like a Christian or to live like a, a Buddhist and so on and so forth. And there's 14. And the idea is that therefore somebody is interested in, in figuring out what kind of uh, uh, difference might make t for you to consider a philosophy of life. That's, that's one way to do it. Back in front. Oh, hello. Thank you so much for this evening. You were speaking of an example of a woman who was about ready to commit suicide, but you heard the voice of her daughter. And that connection, uh, she, with that, she decided it's not just her suicide, it's it's the response and things of others. So did, either, did any of these philosophers uh, have anything to say for example, if Nietzsche's daughter committed suicide unexpectedly without any warning, was there any uh, follow-up, any thoughts of the survivors processing? What did they say? How did they? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, on the one hand, Nietzsche, he doesn't talk about that specifically, but he did want us to have... Um, 
a uh, sorry oh you're talking about survivors right and he he did want us to ha be able to have good deaths and respectful deaths so that we can properly say goodbye to the people that we love and our friends and you know a sort of celebrate life and make it something positive and a celebration rather than something that's that's very sad um Simone de Beauvoir, uh, um, she was much more interested in the relational aspect and sort of surviving um, because of the people we love. So, so n not committing suicide. But um, and in fact, in Beauvoir's uh, in, in real life, um, one of her friends did commit suicide. Evelyn Ray, who was an actress who was um, emotionally or intimately involved with Beauvoir and Sartre, and it was it was tragic because. They they had open relationships with people. Um, and Simone de Beauvoir was uh, kind of said, you know, I think it's our fault. She said to Sartre, you know, I think it's our fault. And we, we didn't take enough responsibility for other people. Um, so in terms of... Um, yeah, they, I, I think they, they didn't face it as much as they could have. But um, they, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the... Um the Stoics do address that directly, uh, the loss of, of uh, loved ones. Uh, all the major, major Stoics do, but particularly Seneca. Seneca wrote three uh, so-called letters of consolation. So he wrote to a friend, his, his friend Marcia, who had lost um, her, one of her sons. And he wrote to his friend Polybius, who lost uh, his brother. Uh, the third letter is actually to Seneca's own ma uh, um, um, mother and that's because he was in exile and so she was distressed because of that so she was she was trying to console her the letters of consolations were a standard philosophical type, type of you know uh, type of thing to write back in, in antiquity and so Seneca is very clear especially in the letter to Marcia the one that lost uh, one of her sons she was in mourning for three years and he finally said look it, it's time now to sort of talk about this thing and, and try to figure out a way to move, move, move on. He first acknowledges that grief, of course, is a part of life and nobody should ask you not to grieve or nobody should ask you to you know, just snap out of it because that's inhuman. You don't want to do that. You, do, you need time to grieve. That's a natural process that happens in, in human beings. But at the same time, sometimes grief becomes actually self-indulgent. It becomes a way for you not to come back to uh, a broader life. He says, he, he, he starts saying, you know, remember, you have other children uh, that you need to take care of. You have your husband, you have your friends. There's people that depend on you. And the fact that you're focusing on, on this thing that happened three years ago, it's actually getting in the way of your own life. And so very slowly, it's a beautiful letter. It's, it's, it's long. It's several, uh, you know, it's like 20 or 30 pages long. And it goes into a detailed analysis of what grief is and how to slowly get out of it. He says, you know, initially you grieve the person and you remember, of course, you know, you, you feel the, 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 the lack of, the, the sudden lack of that person. Eventually what you want to do is to move towards celebrating their life. You want to start to remember the good things. You want to start appreciating the fact that you did have uh, a time of your life when that person was around and it was a good thing and you should therefore shift your emotion. I mentioned earlier on that stoicism is not about suppressing emotion but shifting emotions. That's a perfect example of it. You start out with a perfectly natural, uh, uh, you know, but sad emotion like grief and then slowly you shift it over time towards something that is more celebratory. The other aspect of, of that for the Stoics is that, of course, death is not under your control. Well done. Uh, and, some, and you never know when uh, Fortuna, as they put it, the, the goddess of luck, is going to do it. Uh, the way they, they approach this is kind of similar to the Buddhists, but not quite. They, they, they didn't go really for non-attachment as much as for this notion that um, there's a beautiful phrase in Epictetus where he says everything and everyone you have is on loan from the universe. You don't own anything. Nothing is actually yours. And therefore be glad when the universe has made the loan and enjoy what you have while it lasts. At some point, you know that the universe is going to take it back. You don't know when and you don't know how it's going to happen. So focus on the part that you have. And then when it's gone, you just be grateful that it was there in the first place. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, so 
Uh, so I find Stoic and existentialist views on suicide problematic, and I was wondering what what are the criticisms that you guys have heard from other ways of thinking about the world, other philosophical, philosophical systems that like are just around and that you're thinking about and that challenge, you know, what Nietzsche and Camus and the Stoics are, are saying. Well, before we answer, can I ask you what what do you find problematic about it? I think it's it, it's a little bit like not respectful of the individual to a certain extent and the amount of pain that someone might be in for no reason. I think that trying to put some sort of rigorous structure around when it's okay to kill yourself is, there's a little bit of that. There is certainly a utilitarian critique of it that could hold weight, you know, like if you truly believe that your life is going to, if you think that you're a bad person, for example, and you, you could take a utilitarian stance saying, I am going to cause damage. To the, the only time that I should kill myself is when I'm going to cause absolute negatives, and none of this other fame crap or whatever is, is right. holds any water. Um, but th that's, I mean, I haven't thought about it. No, that's good. <laughs> that, that gives us an idea, at least. You want to go for it? Or? Um, yeah, well, I think, first of all, I mean, there are, uh, the existentials all critiqued one another, and there are plenty of uh, critiques of existentialism. Um, so I think, first of all, they, yeah, I mean, especially Nietzsche, he does joke around a little bit with it, um, but they all absolutely acknowledge that, you know, life can be painful for whatever reason. Um, and, yeah, they do all suggest different reasons why it might be painful, um, but I guess they're looking at the world and trying to say, well, what, what, what are the solutions? Like, how can we even begin to think about this? How can we begin to think about, about people's pain? How can we process it? Um, and in fact, they, they basically said that um, anxiety is a, a fundamental part of the human condition. So I, in a way, I see them as kind of like normalizing the, the pain that we're all going through. And I guess especially, um, you know, in the US, there's very much like a cult of happiness that says we should all be happy or there's something wrong with us. But the existentialists are, are very much uh, against that and say, well, no, I, I think we should lower the bar for how excited we should be about life. It's really hard. Let's, let's acknowledge like either that the world is absurd or it's painful or we may be like flailing about ha and have no idea what, what the meaning is. But I, I see them as trying to suggest suggest things rather I mean none of these existentialists are trying to actually say look this is the rule and this is how everyone lives so I guess I would disagree that they're um, disrespectful of the individual because above anything they're they're um, looking at the individual experience of life and um, and Simone de Beauvoir in particular was like okay well yes we're all individuals but we're in relationships with other people which is why she emphasized kind of that relational aspect as, as a solution. As far as the Stoics are concerned, oh, they get plenty of critics. Uh, there's no, there's no, it's, it's very uh, common to criticize Stoicism, although most of the time what happens is, it turns out, people criticize the Mr. Spock version of Stoicism um, and not the actual, the actual thing. But yeah, it, it, all philosophical schools criticize each other. Uh, that's part of the game of you know, being a philosopher. It's a participatory sport, and it's a bloody one as well. Um, Nonetheless, I, I, I would agree with, with Sky. I would reject the, the notion that the Stoics don't have respect for the individual. In fact, kind of the opposite. Stoicism is one, is a, one particular philosophy within a broader uh, class that it's uh, often referred to as virtue ethics. The Epicureans were another one, uh, the Aristotelians, uh, the skeptics, you know, a bunch of the early uh, philosophies, Greek and Roman philosophies were virtue ethical. And in virtue ethics, the individual is fundamental. It all starts with the individual. It's, there is no uh, you know, view from nowhere like the utilitarians have. There is no God's eye view of society. What it is, it's, it's up to you. It's all about your character and your own decisions. So you're very much responsible for your decisions. Um, and as I mentioned the, in the example of Epictetus rushing to his friend and then trying to convince him that there was really no particular good reason to commit suicide, uh, that's a situation where you're trying to be helpful to other people, but ultimately it is their life. 
So um, the Stoics do oppose, as I said earlier, uh, suicide for no good reason or for reasons of you know, medical situations. It's, we're not, we're not, no, nobody's trying to make it easy for people to do so. But ultimately, if the person has actually thought about it and he or she has good reasons of her own, you know, who are you basically to tell them, no, you shouldn't do it or you know, you're a fool or something like that. It's their life. Um, and so it's actually kind of very much a focus on the individual and on the individual character. The most important question that a stoic or anybody actually in virtual ethics asks themselves is what kind of person am I? What do, am I doing the right thing, not in general for the universe, because I don't control the universe? Am I doing the right thing right here, right now, uh, as far as I'm capable of doing, right? Um, the utilitarian approach is very different. I mean, I'm, as I'm sure you know, there, there is also lots of criticism of the utilitarian position. But, one of the, but I'm glad you brought it up, because one of the major differences between virtual ethics on the one hand and uh, several schools of modern moral philosophy, such as utilitarianism, is precisely that in the first case, you have a focus on the individual and on character development. In the second case, you have this attempt to, to sort of codify things for an entire society. Uh, the Stoics want a, be a better society, but they want to build it from the bottom up, not from the top down. Uh, the ideal Stoic society emerges when we all become wise. It's going to be some time. You know, it's it's going to take some time. But, but that's, that's when it's going to happen. Guys, back there? All right. We're good?